Okay. So, uh, so this so this class will be about polynomials and mostly about the geometry of polynomials. So, so we'll be mostly dealing with the what would often be called geometric properties of polynomials. So this is, so all our polynomials, this means mostly that all our polynomials will be over either the real numbers or the complex numbers. So no finite fields, mostly. Um, and, uh, and what we'll be dealing with is things about coefficients, how do the roots change with coefficients and things like that. So that's what this means. So, so our polynomials will be over. R or C, uh, we'll be interested in properties of or other relationships between between coefficients and 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 roots of the polynomial. And by roots, I mean uh, yeah. So uh, locations. Where are the roots? So, so this is the kind of thing uh, we'll be interested in. Uh, so why why should uh, we care about this in a computer science uh, setting? So let's uh, let me uh, start with this. Uh, just one second. Um, so so this problem. So, uh, so it's a it's a counting problem. So nothing to do with polynomials. So suppose I have a k regular bipartite graph. So both sides, so both sides have n vertices, and each and the graph is by regular on both sides. So it has each vertex has k edges on both sides. So and the question you want to know is the question you want to answer is how at least how many perfect matchings must G have? Okay. So, is there a candidate answer someone would like to give? So, by regular, we have a bi bipartite graph, n words on both sides. Each side has degree k. Uh, and, uh, and we want to know at least how many perfect matchings. Okay, so we'll see. We'll see how to answer this. Okay. So, so, so commentary should already tell you something for this, using the Hall's theorem or something. But we'll try to get something more than that. Okay. So that's one question. Let's look at another question. Okay. So let me first try to make sure this. Okay. So here's another counting problem. So you assume that uh, G is some unrated graph, and STG is a set of spine trees. And suppose I sample uniformly a uh, spine tree from this. So there's no weights here. All the all the spine trees, uh, every spine tree is the same as any other spine tree. And now I take some fixed edges E and F of the graph. And you ask when I sample my spine tree by this process, I look at the probability that a particular edge E is in the in the tree. And I also look at the probability that both the edge, edges E and F are in the tree. And you ask if I look at this probability that E and F are both in the tree. Is that greater than, equal to, or less than um, the product of the two marginal properties? Okay. So, can you maybe some? So, this one maybe is easier to guess what the right answer should be, or is, is there a guess? Yeah, so is there, is there a guess? You do expect that there should be some it negative. Should be, yeah. It should be. Uh, it, it it should be greater than right. So you think that the which which side should be bigger? The left hand side or the right hand side? The LHS might be bigger. Yeah, and why do you think so? Because uh, ENF uh, being in the spanning tree together is a stronger condition than just TA or just F. Uh, 
being in the spanning tree but that is by itself not good enough right i mean there i can certainly give you cases uh, examples where the opposite happens like uh, right so um like i mean just if you've seen the easing model the easing model with right that. right oh, okay 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 mm-hmm. but you're right i mean something like that is the case i mean the point is that if i put a particular edge in the spanning tree some i should expect that the probability of other edges coming into the spanning tree should go down because the spanning tree puts a t- restriction right at i mean one in particular one restriction on a spanning tree that it cannot have more than v minus 1 edges so maybe putting in an edge should make other edges have less probability of coming so that is the intuition but yeah so we'll justify that that is the case so that's again uh, so these are two questions we'll look at within a few lectures and they'll both will solve will answer them both using properties of polynomials so but before that let's start with something very different so uh, so let's start with something much simpler and uh, so Piyush, uh, i have a naive maybe a naive comment so the first first question um can we not count like this like uh, you just number the vertices somehow from v1 to vn yeah mm-hmm. uh, and okay so vertex 1 uh, you choose some edge okay so that will that will eliminate two vertices and not only two vertices it will e- eliminate 2k edges and then you recurse this process mm-hmm. so, so what uh, does it give you that should that 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 always gives you a perfect matching by holes theorem as you, as we just said because um every time you eliminate uh, yes so first we have to argue slightly more carefully but yeah you can prove that there will be a matching but just that's not good enough we want to prove something more than that we oh, have oh, okay, we, we okay, given okay, more I information like it's like first term just asks that the set of neighbors should be at least as large as the at least as large as yeah yeah oh, okay so, okay so here we are we have much more so maybe something more but pure sure hall theorem will give you n minus k factorial or something like that right repeatedly applying hall theorem uh, n minus k factorial that sounds uh... you you're saying it's k regular on both sides right yes yes yeah so you you mean uh, i mean so let's see so, that so n minus k at least n minus k factorial right Let's see. So n minus k factor. So like, I'm just trying to check whether that number is bigger or smaller than what I have. Made. So, uh, so what uh, what you can show that it will be, be it will be at least n over e to the n. So it will so, n over. Uh, so something. Sorry, what I mean. n over e to the n. No, 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 no. So, so sorry. So let me just uh, refresh that. So it's like, uh, uh, so it's uh, k over e to the n. K over e whole to the power n. something at least that much so in part the theorem we will prove is that the permanent of any doubly stochastic matrix wow. is at least n over e to the power yeah. n like n factorial over the n yeah n factorial divided by n to the n n factorial divided by sorry. n to the n n to the n oh that yes. will be okay i yeah. see yeah so this is uh, uh, this was a yeah, conjecture for a long time it was first proved by different methods in the 80s um, uh, what was the conjecture the concept was exactly this that uh, so uh, the, the the permanent of a non so so, 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 so if we look at the permanent yeah, yeah exactly right. under what is the permanent of a w stochastic matrix is always uh, less than, uh, is is uh, all, is always at least this much in fact in fact it divided by into no no that, that i that i agree but yeah. but is this problem equivalent to that uh, no it's not equivalent this is one special case so one special case uh, no i mean like you are saying that that this is a weaker thing like right? uh whatever bound that you get from that one is tight anyway we'll we'll talk we can talk yeah, about yeah so so so, yeah, so so this is i have this, a certain uh, certain uh, uh, way of applying repeatedly hall's theorem in mind okay so let's see let's check me. yeah so i i, I don't see the n minus k factorial immediately but, uh, but so that uh, will be like n factorial divided by so that's like uh, n n factorial so okay so k over n to the n uh, and uh, that is like Uh, yeah, so that sounds like much larger, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it sounds like much larger. So yeah, so but we'll see. Yeah, so so yeah, I yeah. think that is probably not. Yeah, so yeah, not so we'll, the case. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. We can. We can. Yeah. Okay. We can talk about yeah. this yeah. later. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So yeah. But 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 the wonder about this condition is tight in the sense that the condition was in fact to show that the that this is actually the so the. Fully stochastic matrix is actually the uh, uh, the unique uh, minimizer. 
we will not show that it's a unique minimizer. We'll show that show that it is at least it is one of the minimizers, and uh, that we will do. Uh, so we'll okay. Okay. Follow a, a proof of Gurwitz, which will actually most of the stuff I'll probably already say today, and we'll just do it next week. So you are planning to prove uh, just one thing. You are planning to uh, prove the Van der Wa- the show the proof yeah. of the Van der Waarden conjecture using Gurwitz yes. method. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, right, and so okay, so but let's start with something simpler. Uh, so, so suppose we have a probability distribution. Now, not on anything more complicated, but just on integers, zero to d. Okay, so d plus one. Object. So, so you have some natural uh, polynomial associated with this, right? So, the generating polynomial, you just uh, so mu i is the probability of the, that this distribution chooses i. Uh, i goes from zero to d. And you can associate a natural polynomial, which is f mu of x, uh, which is just uh, yeah. So you just attach the variable, the term x to the i, to mu and sum it up. Okay. So one simple observation you can already make because this is the probability distribution is that if you put x to be a positive or even non-negative real number, it is this function does not vanish right? because every term, at least one term is positive. So zero it might vanish, but certainly it does not. It, it does not vanish for anything positive. Zero it can vanish only if, yeah. So zero term there's no probability on zero. But yeah, but in but for positive x it will not vanish. Okay, so that's something pretty trivial. But let's see. So so let's keep that in mind. But now suppose that we assume that its roots are also real. Okay, so let's in, instead of uh, trying to first find locations of roots, let's assume something about location of roots. So suppose I'm told that I have this probability distribution, I write down the generating function in uh, this probability distribution on 0 to t, and I'm also told that the roots of f are real. Okay. So what, where should these roots be now? That's really down the slide. Yeah. And, uh, negative, right? Yeah, 0 or zero are below, right? So non, non-positive. Okay. So in particular, that means that you can, so assuming, so I'm assuming for regularity that mu d is non-zero. So if mu d is zero, why, why would you even write it as a d, d, d polynomial? It's just a distribution up to d minus one. So I'm assuming that mu d is positive. So then that means that you can factorize this f as this in this form. So mu d product of i equals one plus d x plus si, where si is a positive. So when can you do that? Assuming that f is the generating function of, a, of a, so there are two assumptions. f is a generating function of a probability distribution. Mu d is not equal to zero, so that is just a little bit. The main assumption is that all the roots of f are real. But assuming the roots of f are real, you have this factorization. Okay, so this already tells you something very probabilistic also about this probability distribution. So can someone guess it already, or we, let's do this calculation? So th- this is clear, right? So this observation should be clear. Uh, if it, so if there's some issue with the notation, can we just can maybe can wait for a minute. Uh, so you have assumed this. that uh, all the roots are real. Yes, I have assumed that all the roots are real. I and you have assumed all... that all the mu j's are also non-negative, right? Yeah, because it's a probability distribution. Oh, it's so a probability is, distribution. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So mu so, is a probability distribution on zero to b. And I'm also assuming it's actually a probability distribution zero to d, so mu d is positive. No, it's not zero. So then I'm all, all I'm claiming that then the, because the roots are negative, I can factorize it. Like roots are real. Yeah, real, and because uh, uh, there are no positive roots, right? So we just observed already. So because there cannot be any positive roots for this polynomial because right. all the coefficients right. are not right. non-negative, and at least right. one is right. right. So all the roots must be non-positive, and hence you have this. I mean, it also follows from this, no? I mean, because, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, okay. So yeah, so nothing, nothing uh, much so far. But this, just this, you know, of course, thing also tells us something very probabilistic about this. So let's see what it tells us. Uh, maybe people can already guess, uh, but yeah. So it tells you that this probability distribution is actually very special. Uh, the expectation of x power t will grow as order of largest root power t. Uh, yeah, that is uh, 
fine i think yeah, uh, yeah something like that i think you can certainly prove but i am uh, so i am asking for something even more like clean you can actually tell me what this mu is it's actually a sum of bernoulli so that's the answer so let's see why so it is it's again it's just uh, some manipulation it's it's pretty simple man so we said that because it's a product of uh, terms like x plus si yeah exactly yeah so so the point is that uh, so it is like this. so what what would the what would so basically all i am asking you so this is like the current thing so suppose i had bernoulli random variables so consider bernoulli random variables um x1 to xd independent so the probability that xi is equal to 1 is equal to pi okay then what is the so let's call let's let's let uh, so let uh, tau be the distribution a uh, distribution of the uh, sum of so what is the generating function of this is is the is a product of the individuals and yeah. each each individual is like p plus 1 minus p times x yeah yeah so what is so let's just see that so this just let's think so let's think so it's let's say it's gx what what would it, what is it so basically so so let let me write the expression because once you write the expression it's immediately clear why that's the correct answer so 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 make it a different color so is this clear so the point is expand this out and just look at the terms for x to the d those correspond exactly to the probability that exactly d of the x i is one because i assume the independence right so this is an if and only if then right no, so yes yeah, so so this is a regular i have not proven the thing but let us see what so so now let's uh, let's see that this is actually in the same form as f so what does this become so this becomes Uh, so by the way, I'm also assuming again a regularity thing that pi is strictly positive. I mean, any Bernoulli which has pi equal to zero, you can just ignore it. It's never going to contribute anything. Right? So, okay. so what does this become? So this becomes the product of pi and uh, i equal to one to t x plus one minus pi over t. Okay, and now let's just check. So suppose I set, uh, so suppose I set S I uh, to be one over, uh, yeah. So or other. Uh, so suppose, so suppose I choose. Ah, uh, sir. So Is it was the question? Yes, sir. Sir, what is the generating function? It is a moment generating function. Oh, no, no. So I, I define a generating function. So, so, so the, it's much simpler. So the generating function um, of uh, of a probability distribution in zero to d is just defined as like this. So I put uh, as a coefficient of x to the i. I put the probability that the oh. distribution is i. That's it. Okay. Okay. So it's the combinatorial generating. Okay. So, so suppose I choose p i to be. Uh, One over one plus s i. So okay, and, and uh, then I claim that. That f is equal to g, and therefore mu is equal to tau. Okay. 
So there's some things to check here. So what are the things we should check? So so there is uh, some sort of a the- theorem, right? That if two uh, distributions have the same uh, genetic function, then the distributions are also the no, same. No, that's not a theorem. That's just by definition because the way I defined the polynomial. It's just immediately clear the two polynomials are equal and all the properties are the same. Yes, but so this so is a finite distribution. Uh, yes, if you had like, uh, I mean, I'm not sure sure how to prove uh, prove this if you have say the Poisson distribution or something. No, but d d is finite, so right now there's nothing yeah. like that. So d okay, is, okay. D is just a fixed number. Right? So that part is not complicated. One thing that you have to check is pi is actually a probability. Right? Otherwise, this tau might not even be defined. Why is pi a probability? Mm-hmm. SIs are SIs non-negative. are identical to zero. zero. Yeah, so PIs are probability sets. Right? So they belong to zero. So this is clear. Uh, the other thing you want to check is that uh, so there is this here. So okay, so the this factor matches up. So if you write G now, so this factor matches up. Here you have product of PIs. Here you have mu d. So those also have to be equal, right? And they are because now uh, yeah so. This is something I let you just check. So the probability of so tau d is actually equal to p p d and tau d is exactly this uh, because yeah. So for all the burden needs to be one, all of them should be p i. So that's also equal. So this this is just, what what's tau here again? Okay. So tau is the probability. So tau was defined here. Right? So tau is this. Uh, uh, so tau is the distribution yeah. of summation. Right. right. So, uh, Piyush, when you yeah. concluded f is equal to g, yeah, uh, you obviously use the fact, therefore, that these are both probability distributions, right? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. That was important. Otherwise, yes. you can't conclude f. Is equal. Yeah, I mean, it could yeah. be a scaled version of. Yeah, so, 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 so the the the, the pre- place where I'm using it is that mu d is equal to this. Right, right, yeah. right, right. Okay. So what we have proven, uh, so is that, uh, yeah, exactly this. That uh, if f mu is real rooted, uh, then mu must be the distribution of this uh, of a sum of independent Bernoulli random variables. Uh, yeah. So here I change the notation a little bit. So yeah. So if r i is the root, so they're negative. So you know the probability that one minus r. So r i is just minus. Okay. So already, so you see that real rootedness implies some in- interesting constraints, right? Uh, so, yeah. uh, if in general the polynomial does not have real roots, can I do the same thing to conclude that it is the sum of the independent random variables, each of which can take at most three distinct values? So, uh, uh, because the polynomial will factor into a product of quadratics and linears. Yeah, but the yeah. quadratics need not have positive coefficients right? in general. Oh, okay. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So, so, okay. so, so the proposition is that mu, if mu is a pro- let mu be probability distribution on zero onto d with mu d positive, then f mu of f mu x is whatever this is real rooted if and only if for all k. This mu k. So, so the one part. So we show we actually in the proof we have shown both parts. So the both the if and the only if part, right? Because in the construction of G, you saw the topic. For all k, uh, this mu k is equal. To. This probability x i is an independent zero and valued random variables with probability of x i is one over one minus r i, and r i not less than equal to zero are the roots of Okay. So now the question we want to ask is what other properties do these real rooted pol- uh, might these real polynomials have? So here is one that I just dangle in front of you, and we'll use this later, and we'll also prove it. It's not hard. Um, uh, is so this might look more technical than the previous one. It just says that uh, if you have a real rooted uh, polynomial with non-negative coefficients. Then the z- derivative at zero must be somewhat large. Okay. And how large? So there's a term which is like one minus one over d to the power d minus one. Okay. So there's this term, and then times there is something that depends upon the polynomial. So it's like some FT over. D. So this is true for. Uh, so yes, there's some p for which is true. So you have to the infimum over of this. This is true. So we'll we'll use use this later. But this is something some kind of thing that you can just prove 
from real rootedness and again is this like, some rolls theorem kind of argument uh, so this is not rolls theorem this is actually something simpler um, but yeah we'll, uh, we'll we'll see the proof it's not hard. Uh, this just depends upon the fact that these things are real numbers so and and it, again it will boil down to taking the factorization and then applying all the inequalities uh, that we just used but uh, so but the point is that this is in fact this thing will turn out to be all the calculus that we will need in kurovitz's proof everything else will be more or less abstract kind of arguments okay this will be sort of the main calculation but anyway so but uh, but uh, don't try to re remember this uh, what i want to do is to uh, uh, to get to uh, some other properties uh, of uh, so so we'll just change gears and we'll get to some other so called closure properties uh, closure properties of a real rooted polynomial so if i have a polynomial real rooted polynomial what operations can i do on it to preserve its real rootedness okay so that's our next thing uh, and uh, and then we'll come back to stuff stuff like this so any questions so far pius one thing are you yeah. recording this yes Okay, good. And I'll also upload the notes. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's uh, first uh, think of uh, something similar. So suppose, uh, so so let's start with some simple ones. So suppose I have that uh, f. So this means that it, all the coefficients are real. Is real rooted? So as you. so then let me start with some simple ones then so suppose i define this gx which is just f of x plus t where t you know so this is a definition is also real rooted so this is more or less obvious right i mean the roots are very nicely related any root of x you subtract t from it becomes a root of g And those are exactly the roots. And any root of g, add t to it. Uh, sorry, the other way around. You take a root of g, um, and then add t to it. Yeah, it becomes a root of it. So, so there, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, so, so it's sorry, just t t here is arbitrary, right? Yeah, arbitrary real. That's the important. Thing. So the only thing is it's a real number. Yeah. So this will obviously not work with these complexes. Right? So, uh, second thing again, uh, you can scale. So of course, I mean, I'm not writing things like you can scale the polynomial. So, so, so gx is. Um, uh, so, so okay. So this is obvious, right? So this, let's not worry about this. Maybe this is also obvious. So. Uh, okay, but let me. This is just this is just followed by the factorization, right? Which one? This one? No, no. I mean, if, 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 uh, doesn't both one and two follow from the same thing? Uh, or yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Either you factorize or even just argue root by root. Right? To take any root of g, you can construct a root of f immediately, and the yeah, other way but, yeah. yeah, but the factorization just tells you how. The yeah, roots. factorization also tells you immediately that. All of these. How the root shift and all. Yeah, yeah. Same, same factorization works for both. Yeah. So, but let me ask a slightly different one. Uh, wh what about this? No, this does not. It this may not preserve roots. Right? Yeah, this, you... this does not preserve roots. It's easy to construct counter example x squared plus one. So this, yes. Yeah, so, so it's important. The linear operation shouldn't go inside the function, not outside. Uh, the affine operation should go. So now let's uh, look at the first, maybe slightly non-trivial one, which again is the is uh, trivial if you allow if you use your uh, class rules um, thing. But we'll do a proof by hand of it. So f prime x is the derivative of f with respect to x. It's also real. 
so we'll actually spend some time on this although maybe all of you have a proof already of this right i mean so yeah so the hum the zero zeros are always between roots of yeah so rolly's theorem so so rolly's theorem says that for any differentiable function between any two roots of the function there is a root of the derivative so and uh, if you apply that uh, polynomials are certainly differentiable everywhere you apply that to the polynomial you get d minus 1 root of the derivative you are done but let's try to do it more uh, without appealing to rolly's theorem um, more by hand okay so so let's see so so what is so fx is real rooted it has some factorization now let me write it like this minus some of the ri's might be equal right? uh, what about x so what about this f prime x so does this give a nice expression for f prime x it does right it's this uh, uh, standard thing you so you, you it's a product so you have to do the product rule and you get this sum i going from 1 to d j not equal to i x minus r j but let's look at something uh, so let's uh, either using this or by some other tricks you get that this f prime of x over fx has some nice form right what is it so summation 1 by uh, x minus sigma yeah uh, so this is uh, yeah, this is supposed to be uh, yeah. Right. So just from this, or from taking log and differentiate, yeah. so you have this formal identity. Of course, this identity does not make sense when x is one of the roots, but at every other point, it makes sense. Right. So let's forget about those points where uh, f and f prime both have roots. Um, let's just look at what this kind of a function behaves like. Right. So. let me draw the roots r1 r2 so let me say i to use that uh, it will change sign in between r1 and r2 in travels and there will be root due to continuity yeah yeah yes, yeah so i think uh, you already uh, said this right so so let's just look at this suppose so I, yeah so the way i do it the, maybe let me not draw the y, y axis Uh, so, so this is my x-axis. The so y-axis is somewhere. Uh, let me just draw it. So some of the roots. So there's nothing about positive roots here. The roots might be negative. But let's now look at what this function is going to do. So let me also draw these vertical lines here. These are just going to be my guidelines. so let's i know let's look at this function so i start at minus infinity and there the function value is what it's zero but as it approaches as it approaches uh, r r1 the smallest root what happens it goes up and goes up to what so it 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 goes up like is is it actually goes down right it goes down minus infinity yeah so it goes to this one And now, what happens is right after R1, it, it it approaches from the upward infinity, like yeah. The, and then uh, what happens at R2? Those okay. Yeah, so it's like this. And again here also. And you can check that it is actually this uh, that it is actually decreasing in all of these. And then here again. so you see that between any two roots there is a root of the derivative right so this uh, so why did i go, go to the trouble of all this so for, first yeah okay so so this uh, this picture already tells you that so this, this will of course work even so there's nothing here about 3 work for any d uh, and uh, the, the but it also tells you something so it, it actually maybe tells you some way of uh, finding this root right because this function is blowing up so you can detect that right so uh, so it's like so this if you look at this f prime x over fx 
when you start evaluating this, it will start, I mean, it's not something pretty big because it's just because it's like this, it will start blowing up near root. And maybe blowing up is easier to detect in a, in a theoretical argument or in a computation than going to zero. And we will see again. So, uh, so later on in the class, we will see, um, so I'm not sure I'll do that or not. So, the, but, uh, so, wait, wait. The, so, so is the problem finding the roots of FX or if, if, I, if I'm so right now, there's no problem of finding anything. I'm right now. I just want to highlight a feature of this argument, like this argument I did, and it okay. tells you immediately that these, you can find one root of the derivative in between every two roots of the polynomial. Right now I'm assuming that there are no, like the roots, there are no shared roots. That also is easily handled, but let's not worry about it. But I just want to highlight that what this construction does, it may, it gives you a function which has this very sort of drastic behavior near the roots and then does something much more reasonable in between two roots. And this behavior is actually useful in algorithms also. So there, there's a, there's a, there are algorithms that depend upon this behavior actually. So yes, so maybe let's leave it at that. So we'll look at this. We will probably look at this uh, bits, bits, um, uh, Batson Spielman shows us parsifier, which so the so called twice sum on is parsifier um, um, by uh, I think Joshua Batson, uh, Daniel Spielman, and Nikhil Shows. And uh, a crucial thing in the algorithm is to use this. this so this. This kind of a thing uh, has a name. It's called several things. One of the names is Steve's transform. It's not that this, this is not about this Steve's transform exactly, but it also has a similar feature. And and that and for the same reasons, this this kind of expression is useful so because it lets you detect uh, it lets you detect where the roots are in some very nice way and, um, and how far you are from the root. So it lets you measure that also. So if you're far from the root, your value would be small. If you're very close, your value would be blowing up. So so this kind of detection is useful. So, so that is one reason I wanted to do this. Argument. The other reason I wanted to do this argument is actually something like this will generalize to the complex plane. So you will see, uh, so the Rolli's theorem does not have a complex, uh, well, I shouldn't say it does not have, but it's not clear how to generalize to the complex numbers. But for complex polynomials, we will see a very nice geometric generalization of Rolli's theorem, depending exactly upon this expression. So by the way, is the proof clear? So right now I've assumed that f is at f and f prime. So 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 this. So let me say so this shows right now assuming that uh, assuming that f f prime have no common factors. That f prime is also real root. But the fact that even if they have uh, common factors, actually you will see the same argument just works without almost any changes. So I'll just leave that as an exercise. But uh, uh, yeah, so 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 this uh, so 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 this is. It. But now we want to do something. Uh, so so this already shows uh, us that this is real root. But um, I want to just, uh, while we are at it, we want to also do the complex generalization that's called the gauss lucas theorem. So before that, are there any questions about this? So can we do, suppose uh, fx does have a, a one com uh, two complex roots and other real. So mm -hmm. in that case, uh, can we do that for if dash x? It might have more real roots, right? Yeah, yeah. So it can happen. Yeah, there is no reason. Yeah, it can possibly happen that f prime has more real roots than f. No, no, no. Right? Because oh, more real roots. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. So how but, you know, uh, is, is this technique helpful to detect that? In that case. Uh, detect that I don't know. Uh, I mean, so here we have started with the fact that you have real loops, right? So, yes. so this whole graph was based on drawing that the R1, R2, R3 are on the real line. Yes. So this, so in terms of the detecting this is sort of based on it's as you, it starts with that assumption, but yeah, but this, the same, uh, trick will work even in the complex plane for a different thing. So, which is what I want to do now, but, uh, Uh, while, we, while you think of questions, uh, at least write what I was saying earlier. Uh, important. 
Okay, so if there are no questions, so let me just uh, continue. So what I want to do is a, is a gen. Sorry. Okay, so um, So let me actually state this theorem first before we prove it. And the theorem is that, uh, or it's, I think it's really called the uh, So this theorem is that. Uh, so now, so I'm even allowing complex coefficients. Uh, are you assuming that the complex polynomial is still real rooted? No, 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 nothing. Arbitrary complex polynomial. So that's the limit. So if f is any complex polynomial, you look at all its complex roots. So, 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 so. Mm -hmm. Roots of f. Result also that uh, we can get balls down the roots of f. Sorry. Roots of f that slice. Yeah, so that is there are these so-called circular theorems. Uh, yeah, we will not do that. But yeah, so there are many things you can do with these kind of stuff. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, this is the one we will be using. Today. So what is the complex converse? So basically you take the root complex roots of it, you plot them in the complex plane. So then there, there are some points, these points have a convex hull. The roots of F prime will lie inside that, will lie on or inside the convex hull. So, okay. so when you say it's a generalization, a generalization of what? So it implies, it implies for example, Rolli's theorem immediately, right? because if I have a real rooted F, so what is the convex cell? It's just the, I mean, so it tells me that all the roots of F prime have to lie in the convex cell of the roots of F. But if all the roots of F are on the real line, the convex cell is also in the real. Sure, sure. Yeah. So that's what you mean. It's a generalization of, yeah. of Rolli's theorem. Yeah, for polynomials. Yeah. So this this is by the way. So the important thing is that it's not for arbitrary quantities. And we'll see in the proof that it will only work for. But the trick in the proof can sometimes be used for other functions as well. But it's not unlike Rolli's theorem. It's not a statement about all differentiable or all complex analytic functions. It's a statement only about polynomials. So, sorry, mm -hmm. uh, uh, my a little distracting question, or tangential perhaps. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, like we have this Bernstein's lemma, right, where we can say that in, uh, a piecewise, or rather, sorry, a continuous. Uh, function, you know, like uh, continuous up to uh, arbitrary order is all is always approximable by uh, polynomials. Do mm -hmm. we have something similar? That's a density uh, argument. 
I think there is something like that for body. We have something cells. similar. Let me finish the question. Mm -hmm. Let me finish the question. Do we have something similar for complex polynomials? Yeah. So, so the stone based stress. So I think what uh, I think so the stone based stress theorem will apply. Will stone work. Stress. So yeah. I, I said wrong. Yeah. 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 So yeah. that will work. I think in much. Yeah. In in that generality on complex numbers also. But for roots, it's trickier but because uh, you might have so a very good right. approximation have might have roots very far away. So, right, right. so, so, yeah, right. so, so the stone based stress thing I think can be made to work on any compact set in the com in the complex. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's try to prove this. Um, so I said that this. No, so the trick that we had was will be useful. So this, so the main thing I want to note is that this expression actually does not depend upon uh, this assumption that we just made for simplicity that f and f have no common roots. Um, and again, you see that this does not get any problem. So I'll again just write that. So, so two. So basically, we will get same same kind of form here, one by z minus z i. Yes. But what what do we do after that? So that's the thing. So we both side multiply uh, uh, above and below by the conjugate one. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so with uh, uh, counted possibly with multiplicity. So some of these edges may be equal. That's all I mean. So when they are equal, they have common roots of f and f and right? But yeah, so we are allowing that. Not just the other roots of f and okay. So this has, of course, it has, sorry, uh, it's all wrong. Yeah, so this is poles at the root of say, but that's not a problem. But let's look at, uh, we're only going to be looking at this function at points that are not equal to z. But let's look at what happens at those points. So as uh, Sora was saying, you just uh, see. Sorry, what? Am I doing? Yeah. So this thing is uh, I don't want to be. I just multiply by the conjugate on uh, for both of these. So I just here I get z minus z i squared absolute value squared, and here I have z bar minus z i bar. So this is the complex conjugate. So this is so far there's no this is visual manipulation. But now suppose suppose y is a root of f prime. And suppose so if y is already a root of f also, then we are we have nothing to prove, right? Because any anyway, any of the roots of f certainly writes in the conversal of the roots of f, right? So that is just by definition. So so the only interesting thing is when we, y is not a root of f. Which is not a root. But then that means that f y is not zero. F prime y is zero. So then f prime y over f y is equal to zero right? by definition. So f prime y is a root of f prime, and it's not a root of f y. So it's well defined uh, operation. But now let's put it here. So what do we get? But then so but then you get that summation y bar uh, y this one say that. But now we are done. So this, what does this tell us? This tells us. So let let me define. So let's say that C i be one over z minus. Oh, sorry, this is not z. So let's define C i to be y minus z i square. Right? Which is strictly positive because y is not one of the z i. And sum of two. So they, are, they don't sum to one, but they are positive numbers. And then what this expression tells you is that. Y bar is just summation C i is at i bar divided by the sum of so C i's. And after convex, uh, and then and after convex on after convex uh, complex conjugation, you just 
get this because see the real numbers in that presentation. But that's exactly what we wanted. So this tells you that C, why is a convex combination of Z because C is a positive real number. Okay, so so this is a uh, one uh, interesting thing that we just so, got. So, Piyush, sorry, uh, I, I missed how you dealt with the shared root. Case. Yeah, so let's see. So, 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 shared root, let's look at a shared root. So, shared root has to be one of the ZIs. Yeah. So, by it, it is certainly in the convex. Oh, 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 all we are doing is it's in the convex. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. I yeah. think so. Just uh, for curiosity, so uh, is this true for any complete field? If you take any polynomial over complete field, uh, so there is uh, this notion of conjugation involved. Uh, no, so 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 I don't know what what does convex combination even mean in a arbitrary field? That is, you know, maybe it's often as well defined. Uh, um, Yeah, okay, so let's see. So what are the things that you are using? So you're using this notion of there being this conjugate so that if you multiply, you get a positive real number. That's the main thing that you're using. Yes. Uh, so that I'm not sure is true in arbitrary fields, right? Uh, the conjugate no. operation might be more complicated. Yeah, means I, are there any results for arbitrary complete field over? So, so I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but as I said, like in the big beginning of the thing, so this will be about geometry. So everything is in RLC. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was a joke, but yeah. Okay. Sorry, so uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, so okay, so this is one. So this is some some property. So okay, so just to recap what have we done so far, so we understand now that derivatives preserve real uh, rootedness. And also we understand something slightly more, which is that if I take a univariate complex polynomial, then the roots of the polynomial, uh, of the derivative of the polynomial lies in the convex hull of the roots of the polynomial. Okay. One and more thing, what about compositions? What about what? Compositions. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, again, I leave to you. So it's easy to see, so show that composition will not preserve real rootedness. Mm, okay. So, okay, so there's one more operation I forgot to mention, uh, which is also not hard to prove. Maybe let's uh, do that right away uh, because we'll need that now. Uh, maybe I'll be, let me write it as a zeroth. So, gx written as x to the d f1 over x, where d is the degree of x. So what is this polynomial? This is the polynomial which reverses the coefficients. And the fact that it is real rooted is again easy to see just by again the factorization method or by just uh, by just uh, relating roots or by just looking at the factorization. But the important thing is that what this is doing is something nice to the coefficient, right? just reverses the coefficients. So the highest degree coefficient becomes the lowest degree coefficient. Second highest degree coefficient becomes the second lowest degree coefficient, and so on. So, if the roots are uh, far away zero, then it will be closer for the g. Yeah, yes. so the roots are exactly one over x. Yeah, uh, except for what happens at, uh, yeah, so to be careful what happens at zero, but otherwise, yeah, that's all. That's all. Good. So, so now uh, let's look at some more properties of real uh, of uh, probability distributions coming from real root polynomials. So, so one, one, yeah. one, one thing uh, you should, uh, yeah. sorry, maybe we could ask this uh, 
you could answer this at the end of the lecture mm -hmm. uh, so i'm just i was just wondering why in particular real rootedness is so important i mean you could you could think of the complex plane and sort of try to say if the roots are all uh, in a very small slice or maybe on certain line is it the same thing or like yeah okay so if it's on a certain line uh, uh, so okay so what yeah. So where does the real rootedness come? The, the, the real rootedness uh, importance comes most from this probabilistic kind of notation. So we already saw one, which is this sum of Bernoulli. So we'll see one more. And many of those things you can translate. So if it's any line, you can after like rotation of the coordinates, you make it right. real. So there's always yeah. this kind of. We'll see more general things very soon when we go to multivariate phenomena. Like it could also be useful if you have a nice region where the roots lie. Right? Yes, yeah. So, so, so when you, so this become all of this becomes more interesting, especially with multivariate columns, and then you have to look at. I see. Other things. Okay. Okay. So, so now let's uh, look at some um, another uh, combinatorial connection. Uh, so, which is so called Newton's inequalities. So, suppose that. Uh, Suppose that F again is uh, F is real rooted with non-negative coefficients. So we already saw where so we already saw that essentially up to some scaling, such a polynomial is always the um, it's always the generating function of a sum of Bernoulli's, right? uh, some of independent Bernoulli's. But let's not worry about that with uh, non-negative. Coefficients then we are going to claim that. Ai divided by n choose i. So let me just uh, so define bi to be ai divided by n choose i. Then in the sequence b0, b1, bd is log concave. What does that mean? It means that bi squared is always bigger than equal to bi minus one times bi plus one for every. So but if you take the log, it's concave. That's that's what it's saying. Okay. And this in fact implies so this is a stronger thing than saying that uh, it also this also it's also implies that the sequence A is also log concave. So in fact, B i is being log concave, it's called A being so, ultra log concave. Uh, when you say concave, you just mean that log B i minus one plus B i plus one by two is yes, exactly. the log. Yeah, it's the usual definition of concavity. Uh, but yeah, because commentary is easier to think of it in this. So one, why is log concavity important? It's, it's uh, so why why does this imply this? That's actually just a trivial argument involving some inequalities with the binomial. So yes, yeah, so it's just it's not hard. So you write down the inequality for BI and show that this is actually a weaker inequality. So that is not tricky, uh, not hard. Uh, what we will show is the first one. So basically, what that says is that uh, that so this one is also called that AI. Is, so this is also written as AI is ultra log. Okay. So it remains log concave even after normalizing by n to z. This is is ultra log concave of order d because sorry there's no n right so it's only d. It's ultra log concave of order d. <laughs> Okay. But what is this 
ultra log concavity so exactly this this the first line the the, the sequence bi that you define by dividing each ai by d2 side is also log concavity so it's oh, a stronger the... so yeah so, okay. so it's yeah it's a calculation to show that this is actually a stronger property that if you have bi is log concave which is to say that a is ultra log concave then log concavity of ai just follows <laughs> So yeah, so that's so this is what we want to prove huh? that the coefficients of a so why so these things are also called Newton's inequalities. Why Newton's inequalities? So the point is that each AI is a symmetric elementary symmetric polynomial of some positive real numbers, right? So it's a inequality. Bit, so okay, so so another way of writing this is that uh, uh, I think it's multiplication, right? Not comma in AI minus. Oh yeah, yeah. This, yeah. This is, this is, yeah, so okay, so it's why it's Newton inequality will come right? Yeah, so, so so the point is that is if, if you look at the roots of f, then all of these AIs are elementary symmetric polynomials of the roots of f. So this is saying that there's an inequality between elementary symmetric polynomials of non-negative real numbers. So sorry, uh, I completely missed this argument. Can you what argument? No, what is an elementary symmetric polynomial? So what are the coefficients of a polynomial? Right? So they are exactly elementary symmetric polynomials of the roots. Okay, so it's yeah, so it will come to that. We'll come to that. Um, I mean, just expand their factorization and you get that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll come to that uh, just, just after the proof. So, but let's do the proof first. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so now we want to prove this. So let's first check some simple cases, right? So, so, so proof. So let's first start with some examples. So suppose our call, uh, suppose D was equal to two, then do we have this? So what is D then? So D is like a two X square plus a one X uh, plus a zero is real root. Okay. But then what? Uh, B square minus 4 should be greater than equal to 0. Yeah, so A square minus 4 A 0 A 2 should be greater than equal to 0. Yeah, so it's actually an if and only if in this case. And but what is that is exactly the same thing as saying that A square over 4 A 0 A 2 are positive, so you can write it, it is greater than A 0 A 2. Okay, and, uh, and, and this is exactly the log concavity condition. So the theorem at least is true for d equal to two. Right? Great. Okay. So so now what? Uh, so how do we go about proving, proving it for general case for the general case? So somehow we want to get some. So we have. We have this big polynomial, which has it has so many coefficients from a, sorry, a zero to a d, and uh, we want to somehow get an ex, get some. So remember, so that d claims you are making here, right? This is d minus one claims we are making here. One for each i, i going from one to d minus one. So we want to get to one of those i's, right? So we want to get to some i which is there, right? I mean this uh, this. Uh, we want to get we want to we want to get to maybe a polynomial which has only these three coefficients so how can we get to that polynomial? so do things that we have done so far seem to so i mean uh, you can fact all, all always factorize and uh, say that so you need real rooted first of all so so f is real rooted fine yeah, so you can factorize and say that. Um, but you factorize and then remove remove factors that can change the coefficients in some very bad way. So, so can we write that AI is the sum uh, as a submission of those uh, real roots, and we can do something from uh, like the similar way we have done for that second. Uh, yeah, so, so that that is sort of yeah. So we want to actually prove that fact that the symmetric polynomials have an equality. So we'll actually prove that as a as a corollary of this. So no, so 
So, so that sort of that would become circular for us. Yeah. So, yeah, so you're saying you apply Newton's inequalities, but we want to prove the Newton's inequalities. Okay. Okay. Maybe derivatives. Uh... Yeah, yeah, this yeah. looks so, like a... yeah. That's the point. We take the derivatives. We want to get rid of. So we want to get rid of everything before AI, AI plus one, and we also want to get rid of everything after. Uh, so they, we want to get rid of the coefficients that are lower than i minus one, and all the coefficients that are higher than i plus one. And maybe the derivatives can help. Certainly, derivatives can help in getting rid of coefficients that are. Lower, 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 lower than i minus one, right? So how how do we get for that? So take the derivative i minus i i i times. So if you take the derivative uh, i times, uh, not i times, you i minus one times. Yeah, i minus one times. Then you no, get i minus every... one times. It will leave a constant at the i minus one. Yeah. So but you want the i minus one thing, right? Because this inequality oh, oh, has. Oh, oh. Them. We can so all. That... Do... That uh, we can also consider the g of x that you just define now. One should... by x. Uh... So one by x. Uh huh. And then what? And do the same thing to remove the all the... higher order. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so this is yeah. So you guys have more or less got the proof. The proof is first uh, define this g of x. Uh, let me not call it g of x. Let me call it h of x, which is obtained by uh, differentiating. I uh, I minus one times the polynomial f of x. Okay, so what is this polynomial? So it is just uh, I going from zero to t. AI, uh, sorry, uh, okay. Um, so, so, uh, so, so general case fix one fix i. X a particular i, uh, and now this is j going from zero to d of a j and d i minus one, d x i minus one, x j, and what is that? So uh, so this is so everything of of uh, after i minus one will just be dead. So um, And then there is something, right? So there's a coefficient. So this we have to keep track of. What is the coefficient? It is this uh, polling factorial right? uh, of uh, j i minus one times, which is exactly nothing but j factorial divided by uh, j minus i factorial. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's our. So let's just write slightly differently. So, so I want to so replace j by j plus i minus one. So, Uh, I think this is there, but it's yeah. So let's keep this. Okay. Uh, so 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 yeah. So this at least gets. So let's just check it this time. So this is uh, going from so uh, let's, um, so j is i minus one. Um, wait, no, this is not quite right. Uh, 
So let me just write this following pattern. So it's yes, first time you get J, second time you get J minus one. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I think this is this is the right one. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So uh, so it's just it's just check that. So yeah. So and this is just a translation of coordinates. So this. Is okay. Good. So now and now uh, so now this is a what degree polynomial? So H is a degree D minus I plus one polynomial. Its highest degree coefficient. Is what it's still a d right so uh, yeah so so a d times something and the lowest degree coefficient is it's constant it's constant term correspond to j equal to zero is a i minus one times something and what is that i minus one factor Now, now as Sarah said, so we now we want to get rid of the higher order, higher terms. So, so to do that, we first invert the polynomial. So, so second step is that this uh, let me call it kx, which is x to the d minus i plus one h one over x is also real to it. And the similar calculation will give something like a i plus one into i plus one factorial. So, 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 so let me just do that. So 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 so, so, so then this kx, uh, yeah. So now it'll uh, invert. So what you will get is this. Now instead of j, you have uh, d minus i plus one minus j. The coefficient will change actually. No coefficient will be remain the same because you just I just change the. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now so yeah so now instead of doing all this calculation again, what I will just tell I just tell you what to do now. Now you do the same trick on this. So, so now let's look at what this is. So this now the so the point is that the the lowest, the highest three terms. The highest three. Coefficients of k are what? So the highest one, which is corresponds to j equal to zero right now, is a i minus one times i minus one factorial. The second highest one, which corresponds to j j equal to one, is uh, so so the degree yeah, so is a uh, i. Uh, I factorial, and the third highest one corresponds to a i plus one. So j is corresponds to j equal to two, uh, i plus one, and this is i plus one factorial by two. Okay. So these are the ones you actually actually want, and the remaining we want to get rid of. The remaining, uh, the remaining. D minus I uh, uh, minus one coefficients. We want to put it. Who is coming there? Yeah. So it's just because J is equal to so we want to put it. So let's not worry about the numerical things. So they are correct, but uh, let me just want. I just want to get to what what you are going to do. You want to get to that. So how do we get it of those? 
So you again differentiate. Now differentiate d minus i minus one times, right? So uh, rather, yeah. So so the degree of this guy. So this the degree of this thing is exactly d minus i minus one. So you differentiate d minus i minus one times. That will get rid of everything else except for this. And now you'll be left with a quadratic polynomial, which is real rooted. And because the quadratic polynomial which is real rooted, you will just apply the result from quadratics to see the the fact that discriminant is non-zero, and you will get exactly this statement. So, so define so the, The point is that this Tx will now be a quadratic polynomial. So, so the, the thing I want to highlight is that you did not need to know the result to get this. You could just start with the real rootedness, do this operation, and get the correct answer. Okay? So there's you did not need to know the log concavity or the log concavity. This machine will just give you the correct result, okay. um, and uh, in a sort of mechanical way. So and uh, so, so 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 just to highlight, uh, so note that you did not need to sort of need to know the result to start proving it. The our machine will sort of give us the right inequality anyway. And we can also tell what kind of inequality it will be. It'll it'll involve it'll involve AI squared in the middle. And it will involve saying that ai square times some con something which depends upon i squared is bigger than ai minus one ai plus one and something else and that something else is only depending upon these numbers with these i's and so on so the exact calculation of doing this i'll just leave to you uh, instead of chasing the indices but the point is this that uh, this machine is just going to give you the answer anyway even if you didn't know it and you can even at this point you can even say what that answer would be that answer will involve saying that ai squared times some ci squared where ci is just a function of i is bigger than ai minus one times ai plus one and it's just that all the inequality is telling that is this ci is exactly this kind of this ratio of binomials okay so what uh, and then I, as you also said uh, so this again is an exercise that this is actually a stronger property than this again just by doing the appropriate cancellations so the coefficients of any real rooted uh, polynomial with non with non negative coefficients are ultra log concave and hence also log concave so in particular this implies that if that the sum of bernoullis is uh, so so this is a fact that you probably know right that if you take the sum of Bernoulli's independent Bernoulli's, the resulting distribution has this kind of a log concavity property. It's in the sense that it looks like a Gaussian. So the Gaussian distribution is log concave. The density of Gaussian. Please, where did we where did we exactly use the real rootedness in the in the whole proof? Because we, right, right, good. Yeah. So where did we use the real rootedness? So let's see. So yeah. So yes. Yeah, so this is a good question. So can someone else point out to me where have we used the real rootedness? Uh, first time we use that hx as real root because f is real root. Uh, D equals yeah. to two, you use then you use exactly. Yeah. So, use yeah. Yeah. so the final calculation that you have to do. Okay. okay, okay, I see. I see. So the point is that you always only do those operations that preserve real rootedness. So the ultimate quadratic polynomial you will get 
this polynomial t, which will have coefficients a i minus one, some some function of i times a i minus one, some other function of i times a i, some other function of i times a plus one. That quadratic polynomial will be real, and hence you can apply this old Brahmagupta or Shriyachar or whatever era formula. To, so if we just consider the general uh, real polynomial with real roots, yeah. So it's like the inequality will reverse whenever the uh, no. So actually, what I so I didn't need positivity. I think uh, you you can do this whole argument. You will get uh, some quantity. I think going from ultra log quantity to log quantity might be trickier than because I, I, of science. I'm, I'm but sorry, otherwise, I'm not. I'm not trying to say that real roots. I'm saying that yeah. if we just consider a general real polynomial. Yeah. So, so in that case, whenever the complex roots are there, so it will the re, it will only reverse. Nothing. No, else. no, it's no. Uh, that's not clear, right? Uh, I mean, uh, so the whole point. Remember, we did operations that preserve real rootedness. What is preserving non-real rootedness? There's nothing like that. Right? Hmm. I see. I see. Okay. So it might be the case that one, while you are differentiating, you are now in the real case. Fine, so suddenly. Okay. Okay, so so the upshot of this is that real rooted polynomials with non-active coefficient at least uh, the uh, so okay so so the ultra log concavity will work even with uh, without the non-negativity constraint, but we are interested mostly in the non-negative coefficients case. So so you have uh, so this non-negative. Right? So you were saying something about the Gaussian. So. Uh... Uh, yeah. So the point is, yeah. So so it tells us something. Yeah. So what we are, what I was saying is that. So now suppose look at the let's look at the non-negative case. Uh, so we have this log concavity. So we have log concavity of what? So let's think of some distribution mu one zero one to the d, in which which had a real rooted generating function. So we know that such a distribution we already saw. It's some. It's a distribution of sum of Bernoulli's, and any sum of Bernoulli's has that form. And now we have also shown that any such f, the coefficients of this are log concave. So it means that the density function of any sum of Bernoulli's is log concave. In particular, it's unimode. It has to have a single mode. All of these things are sort of intuitively clear, but here this machine is already giving you all those for free. And log concavity is even more important because log concavity tells you maybe something that is like the central limit theorem the central so what so, so the gaussian distribution is the ultimate sort of the log concave distribution so what is its density like it's e to the power minus x squared so x squared is sort of the archetypical convex function minus x squared is therefore the archetypical concave function and e to the that is therefore the archetypical log concave function so the gaussian is sort of so log concave distributions are supposed to be generalizations of gaussian because the gaussian sort of has certain nice properties many of which carry over to log concave and this is saying that Sums of Bernoulli have the property for for free. We are getting that uh, that information. So, so uh, uh, Piyush, yeah, yeah. Uh, the non-negativity. Where was this used in the in this? Yeah. So, 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 so this whole thing will not use non-negativity. I think the only place where you will need to, you might need to use it, is to go. So, in this simple thing of showing that ultra log concavity is stronger than log concavity, because there maybe the science matter. Maybe even there they don't matter. But yeah, but in the yeah, improving ultra log concavity, you will not need. So that's why you might not be needed for the ultra log concavity part. So the, so the argument as I did does not use it. So ultra log concavity will not. So so you you will see will. Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean yeah I think yeah the one point is that. Uh, um, Right. I mean, so oh yeah, actually, yeah, it's I think probably something. So, so the thing is that if 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 uh, if both sides are so okay. So if one side is so only this side can possibly be negative, right? So I think the sign thing it doesn't matter at all. So yeah, so it doesn't. It's not. Negative. But yeah, we'll apply it to that. Apply it to the quality. So sum of independent things, sum of independent values.
लॉक ऑन के पेंसिल्स So unimodal means it has exactly one mode. This also seems sort of intuitively obvious for Bernoulli's, but this is a pretty mechanical way of proving that it's the case. Sorry, define this term again. Hence, unimodal densities. Uh, what do you mean by that again? So, so, so you just look at the probability density. What is the probability of zero? What is the probability of one? What is the probability of two? This thing has a single maximum. Single maximum. Okay. Yeah, mode, mode. So it has a, just one mode. Ah, ah. Or, or at least, I mean, even if it has multiple modes, they all like. So, you, I mean, like, uh, yeah, actually, no, actually, yeah, it, it can't happen. So, yeah, so, 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 like, they're all equal, and then, so, so the graph basically looks like this. It can't have like, can't look like. You cannot have multiple maxima. Okay. Yeah, like this. Okay. Because of okay. concave, because of this concavity. Too. Okay. And lock concavity is equal to this. So law concavity implies this. Implies any any kind yeah. of concavity implies this. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the point is that yeah, in in the middle you are bigger than the other like the you are bigger than the average of the remaining two. Right? So then, if 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 you had a if you had your, if you had a picture like this, then this point guy will contradict it. That's the Okay, so uh, so one thing I one question maybe I would like you to think about uh, because it's already the end of the class is uh, so question does ultra log concavity imply real dependence? So so let me just write it like this. So 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 yeah, there's a big picture question is does ULC ultra log concavity imply real dependence? And the formal thing is that let f be so non. Let me assume non-negative for now. F uh, degree D. So in d equal to two, this is true, right? So the question is, is general in general too. So let's stop with this. Um, and uh, if there are any questions, take it. And... So Piyush, uh, I have to leave, but uh, you will post this uh, from your web page. The, the, yes. the, the link, the link to the video. Uh, yes.